All right, we were going to get me at the gym, but we decided that guy would have to do. All right, so as you can see, we start a new series today entitled Run to Win, Living in Victory in 2023. And if you got the email, you know that here next month we are going to dive into the book of Mark, and we are going to be there for a while, all right? And uh, Mark is of about 16 chapters, and it's going to take us a while to get through it. And so we have a little mini-series to kind of kick off the new year before we dive into the book of Mark, which we'll be in uh, for quite a while after that, all right? So Run to Win is uh, the title of this new series, and uh, I'm excited because I think it's going to help us really kind of get focused as we start here into a new year, all right? And so I know we're a weekend, and I know I wasn't here last week necessarily to start this series, but hey, a weekend is not too late to develop some habits and some prints and some practices that will help uh, propel you into the rest of 2023, all right? So I encourage you maybe take some notes today, and uh, this will be about a four-week series, and then we will dive into the book of Mark, which will kind of launch with our small groups, our life groups, and things like that. And so excited for what we have coming up here in the days and weeks to come. So if you knew me growing up, you would know that I was a sports junkie, I guess you would say. Um, Whether it was watching sports or collecting sports cards or whether it was playing sports, uh, pretty much everything in my life revolved around sports. Now, I wasn't the best athlete ever, but I enjoyed to play sports. I tried hard, and, um, and it was just something that consumed a lot of my time. If you walk into my bedroom uh, when I was in high school, you'd see basketball posters up and all sorts of stuff like that. And uh, it was safe to say that I was a sports junkie as I was growing up. You know, pretty much any sport there was to try, I would try. My mom wouldn't let me play football, but I did like to play backyard football and things like that and, and, uh, and whatnot. And so pretty much any sport I tried, from bowling to swimming to you name it, I probably tried it if it was around, right? We have some sports here in New England that we didn't have necessarily in Ohio growing up, like field hockey and lacrosse. I never played any of those, but uh, a lot of the sports I did play at some point or another growing up. And so... Even at one point in my life, I tried track, right? As a seventh grader, everybody was doing it, right? So I'm like, you know what? I don't necessarily like to run, but I'm going to give track a try. Realized very quickly that I didn't want to run track, so I had shifted to some of the field events, right? Pole vault looked pretty fun, and so I gave pole vaulting a try. Never really could make it over the clearing height or the opening height for the bar, and so my track career did not last long. I preferred to run after things that involved a ball and things like that as opposed to just running for fun. But I uh, did try track a little bit, and I didn't really like to run necessarily growing up, but as I've gotten older, I've developed... I don't know if love is the right word, but a fondness for running, or should I say jogging? That's probably a better term for it is jogging, right? Uh, Because I'm not running competitively. I'm not breaking any speed records in my mile splits or anything like that, but I enjoy the idea of getting out and just jogging, getting your heart rate up. And for me, it really is a good way for me just to kind of clear my mind and to think and to kind of relieve some stress and things like that. So I've come to enjoy jogging as I've gotten older. But I do know this, in my limited time in doing track and field, and I have run a mar- jogged a marathon in my life, I do know that uh, if you are going to be a, a, like a competitive runner, It takes a lot of work, a lot of discipline, and there's a lot of things if you're going to be a track athlete that you have to commit your life to if you want to win. So while I jog slowly to get exercise and clear my head, track athletes run to achieve a prize, and they put their body through a great deal in order to attain that prize. And it reminds me of what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 24, where the Bible says this, Do you not know... That in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives a prize. So run that you may obtain it. So this is going to be the theme verse for our New Year's series. And it's my prayer that through this series, we will be equipped and challenged to start 2023 off on the right spiritual foot. It's my hope that as we look back on 2023, a year from now, each one of us will able to be able to look back and say that 2023 was one of our greatest spiritual years ever. However, in order for that to happen, I do know this. It's vital that we develop some some practices early on in the year to help us if we're going to 
uh, continue walking in that direction for the rest of the year, right? Because how you start often has a lot to do with how you are going to finish. And so you can see here that the title of our message today specifically is simply this, the race is on. We're going to look at that verse I just read, but I'm going to give you some context here uh, in just a second. But let me pray and then we'll dive into kind of uh, this opening message of this series uh, this morning as we kind of talk about this idea of running to win in 2023. So Father, thank you for this time we have together. Thank you for your word that speaks life and speaks truth to us. And Lord, I pray that as we spend a few minutes here just opening our heart to what you have to say to us, Lord, that you will help us, Lord, to be receptive, help us have open ears and open hearts to what you want to do in our lives, and we'll give you the praise and the glory for it. Lord, we know that your word can transform our lives, Lord. We know that your spirit wants to do a work in us, and so, Lord, I pray that each of us will open our hearts up to what it is that you want to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look with me if you will, let's get some context of this verse if we could, and uh, let me see, I think I have it up here, maybe, all right, Brian, is the passage on there, the 2 Corinthians, or the 1 Corinthians passage? No, this is the 1 Corinthians that Tom said was the... Uh, it's just this? All right, then, hey, you're going to have to look in your Bibles. I thought I put it up there, so that is my bad. I'm already starting the year off on the wrong foot, so here we go. All right, 1 Corinthians 9. Look with me, if you will, in verse number 19. Verse 24 is there on the screen. Verse number 19, just so we can get some context, because I know we're landing kind of right in the middle of a passage, and typically I like to take a book like we're going to do in Mark and walk all the way through. But for this short series, we're kind of diving right in the middle. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, probably the most carnal, wicked, evil church in a lot of ways as far as the people go, very carnal there in Corinth. And Paul had made several visits to the church in Corinth and the people there. And so he's writing here in chapter 9, beginning in verse number 19, he says these words, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control. Lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So as we dig into this passage this morning, the first thing I want us to see is the calling into the race. As we begin, like I said, it's important for us to understand the context of this verse, all right? As Paul is writing here in chapter 9 to this church in Corinth, he is explaining uh, really about just how passionate he is about sharing the gospel. He is talking about this idea that he will put his freedoms aside if it means that he can have an audience with others and have the opportunity to share with them the love and the gospel of Jesus. And he says, I became all things to all people so that I might hopefully save some. Paul is giving us here kind of a, an idea of just how passionate he was with sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those around him. He didn't want any of these external things to get in the way of, of his passion for sharing Jesus with others. And so he was willing to set aside freedoms that he had in Christ in order to minister to the Jews or whoever it was he was ministering to. He wanted them to know that he desired to share with them Jesus more than anything else. And as you study the writings of Paul throughout Scripture, you find that Paul often used pictures from the athletic world in his letters. And as he writes this to the Corinthians, they would have been very familiar with this idea of running races. Because if you know anything about ancient history, obviously you've heard of the Olympic Games, but there was another big athletic event called the Isthmian Games that took place in Greece. And those were second only to the Olympics. And those were held 
here in the city of Corinth. And so they would have been very familiar with this idea of running. And many of them would have been there observing these games, watching these athletes run to compete for this, this crowd and this prize that they would get. And so Paul is bringing that to the context of evangelism, saying how he desires to, to run and to give his all to sharing the good news of Jesus with others because when he stands before God, he doesn't want to you know, look back on his life and realize that he missed out on those opportunities. And so that is kind of the context with which we find Paul writing this uh, thought about running the race. So he wanted to make sure that his life counted. And that same desire should rest in the hearts of every single child of God. If you're here today and you are a follower of Jesus, that should be your desire as well. You should desire for your life to count for God. You should aim that your life would have significance in the kingdom not so much just for living for the moment here on earth. And so the same desire that Paul had is the same desire that you and I should have as we live our lives. God has called us to go and to make disciples. And Paul understood that very clearly. In fact, it says in Matthew 28, the great commission that God gives to us. He says, Jesus said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so that is the commission that God has given to his church, to individual believers, Every one of us are called to go and to make disciples. Paul understood that as an apostle, but do we understand that as children of God? So often I think we try to relegate that to somebody else and say, well, that's somebody else's responsibility or that's somebody else's job. But the reality is that God has called all of us to be a part of the ministry of reconciliation. In fact, that's how it phrases it later on in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 18. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You see, that's not just given to pastors or apostles or teachers no, that is a ministry given to everybody, the church as a whole. And so as Paul is writing here and he's talking about his passion to share Jesus with others and how he's willing to set aside his freedoms so that he can see people come to Christ, we need to understand that the same passion that Paul had to see people come to Christ is the same passion we should live with because it's our responsibility to see a lost world reconciled to Christ, to be brought back into a restored relationship with Jesus. And I love how Paul says in the passage we just read, look back at verse, uh, chapter, or verse 16 here in chapter 9. He says, um, for if I preach the gospel, it gives me no ground for boasting, for necessity is laid upon me. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Do you just see his heart and his passion here for sharing the love of Jesus with people around him? I mean, Paul encountered so many different obstacles along the way, so many different hardships and challenges, but yet he was motivated, despite all of that, to share the love of Jesus with those around us. And he says, woe to me if I preach not the gospel. You see, if we are going to run to win in 2023, we must understand that we are called to make Christ known, but if we're going to make Christ known, we have to know him ourselves, and we need to be passionately pursuing him ourselves, because really evangelism is probably is going to come as an overflow of our relationship with Jesus. You're not going to be, you know, excited to tell somebody about something if you're not excited about it yourself, right? And so if I'm not excited to love Jesus myself, how excited am I going to be to share it with other people? And so our desire as believers is to know Christ and to make him known. In fact, Mark 12 says this, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Right? Everything about our lives should be consumed with a passionate pursuit of loving God more deeply 
and more intimately. And as we fall more deeply in love with him, that love will overflow into a desire to see those who are lost and without Christ come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. And our lives will just overflow with that love. So that is the calling for each of us to enter into this race. To enter into this race where we can live our lives for something significant. That we can live our lives that matter. Where we can run to win as we enter into this new year. So that's the calling into the race. The next thing I want us to see as we look at this passage are, oh, there it is. Uh, I knew it was on there somewhere in the wrong spot. The characteristics of the race. So we saw the calling into the race. Now let's look at the characteristics of this race that, that Paul is talking about here. Now that we've seen our calling in the race, let's look more specifically at some of these details. The first one I think we need to understand is that this race is not against other believers. As we talk about the race that we are running, we need to understand that we are not racing or competing against other believers, right? You are not the opposition. You are not the competition in this race. God has given each of us a race to run in our own individual lives. We're all on a different spiritual journey. We all have a different sphere of influence. It's not about what we've been given, but about how faithful we are with what we've been given, right? And so we aren't competing against our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not about being more talented or more gifted than somebody else. In fact, the other day, as I was studying this, it reminds me of a conversation I had the other day with one of the boys and uh, somebody had said uh, they were singing or something, and somebody had said you know, that his sister was a better singer than him. And so he was upset and disappointed about it. And so I was talking to him and saying, hey, buddy, it's okay. You don't have to be the best at everything, right? And I had to say, you know, daddy's not the best at anything. You know, there's a lot of people who are better dads than me and better preachers than me and better, you know, this and that. And I went on. I said, it's not about being the best. It's about giving your best and doing your best in whatever it is God's calling you to do. Right? And that's the truth of this spiritual journey that we're on. God's not looking for you to compete against the person sitting next to you. God's not looking for you to measure up to that person or this person. He's looking for you to be faithful in what he's given you and to run your race and give it everything you have with what he's given you. Does that make sense? So it's not about competing against my brothers and sisters and seeing you know, who can do the best, quote unquote. It's about running the race that God has given you individually. When it comes to the church, it talks about it being a body, right? That we all have a role to play. Some might be the hand, some might be the foot, somebody might be, you know, all these, but we all have a role to play. And that's the idea. We're not competing against one another, but we're all running our own individual race, striving to be faithful in what it is that God has called us to. To do. You're going to experience things on your journey that I might not go through. And I'm going to go through things in my journey that you might not experience. But God's call to us is to be faithful in what it is he has given us. To be faithful in the race that he's calling us to run. So the race is not against other believers. But I do want you to know this. The race does consist of a common opponent. The race does consist of a common opponent. Ephesians 6 verse 12 says this. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authority, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You see, we do have a common opponent. And that common opponent is a spiritual enemy of our souls, the devil, who would want nothing better than to see us trip up and fall. Right? In fact, this week we had some nice days and I was jogging listening to a podcast. I don't remember who said it. I think it was Kazahan, but he, he, he's made this statement. He says, Satan knows that he cannot steal our salvation, so he tries to hinder our sanctification. Amen. Satan cannot steal our salvation, so he tries to hinder our sanctification. So in other words, Satan knows that he can't snatch you from the Father's hand. But what he wants to do is he wants to try to get you to trip up and mess up and distance yourself from God so that you don't make an influence for God. And so that you don't grow, and so that you don't become more like Jesus, he wants to keep you at every turn from becoming more passionately in love with Jesus. And so we need to understand that that is what our enemy desires. He wants nothing more than to see you get complacent. 
He wants nothing more than to see you not read your Bible, not pray, not come to church, not fellowship believers, not be in communion with others. He wants nothing more than to see you just isolate yourself and just live your life the way that you want to live it with no mindset towards God whatsoever. And so he knows he can't steal your salvation, so he's going to do his best to try to rob you of those opportunities to grow. And so we need to understand that we aren't racing against other believers, but we do have a common opponent in this race. And it is an enemy that is looking at every turn to keep us from falling more deeply in love with Jesus. Another characteristic of this race is that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. You see, this race is not one that's going to be just run this year and then, okay, I can take a break. No, this is a race that lasts for a lifetime. It's a journey that we are constantly on as we are pursuing Jesus. Thus, the race requires endurance. So you may look back on your life and see, hey, I've gotten lazy in my spiritual life in the past. Well, the great thing is it's a marathon. The race isn't over. You can pick up today and start running a little bit better pace than what you were in the past, right? You might have gotten lazy. You might have started to walk in the race. But you can start today and pick yourself up and say, you know what? I need to pick up the pace a little bit. I need to go to the gym. I need to start spiritually doing these things that are going to help me grow because it's a marathon. It's not about where I'm at now. It's about how I finish. And so I can keep running and I can keep pressing on and I can keep moving and I can start today no matter where I've been in the past. Amen? And so we need to understand that is one of the characteristics of this race. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. And if you're going to run a marathon, you have to learn that it's a long race, right? And you have to learn to pace yourself. And you have to learn that, hey, I can start out super fast. But that doesn't mean that's how I'm going to finish. When I ran my marathon, my first mile, boy, it was good. It was pretty fast. Like in my training, it was like better than what I wanted to be. But mile 21 and mile 22 when I had to walk, those paces were not so good, right? Because what happened? I lost focus in the beginning or started out too fast and then it caused me to trip up at the end. So we need to understand it's a marathon. So no matter where we've been or what pace we've been running, we can start to say, okay, I need to get on track and I need to start running this pace and doing these things to help me draw closer to Jesus than where I've currently been. So the race is not against other believers. The race does not consist of a, or does consist of a common opponent. The race is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Another characteristic is this. The race is eternal, not temporal. Notice what he says here. Every athlete, in verse 25, exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath or crown, but we an imperishable you see, Paul is saying, listen, all the athletes you observe running in these Isthmus games, these Greek games, they are running to receive a crown, a wreath that will fade away, that will perish. But when you and I run the Christian life and we, you know, enter the, this journey with Jesus, we need to understand that it is an eternal race, that we are storing up treasures in heaven that will last forever. And that's why we need to be so focused on sharing the love of Jesus with others, because one thing that lasts forever are souls of people. And if we will share the truth and the love of Jesus with others and, give, and they come to the kingdom, that is an eternal treasure stored up on your behalf. And, and we have other treasures we are trying to store up in heaven where the Bible says moth and rust don't corrupt. But we need to understand the race we are on is not a temporal race, but an eternal one. So we must not allow ourselves to get consumed with all the temporal distractions of the world. Anybody find that there's plenty of things in this world that can distract you from pursuing Jesus? Anybody else find that if you're not careful, it's easy to get caught up into all these temporal things of the world that cause you to lose focus on your love and your relationship with Jesus? It doesn't take long, does it? You lose focus for a second, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what happened? I was praying, and now I'm thinking, what? You know, how, how'd that happen? Or, you know, I, was, I sat down to read my Bible, and an hour later, I haven't even opened my Bible. Like, right? It's easy to get distracted from simple things, but also the big things. As we try to journey with Jesus, it's easy to get distracted. So we must be aware of that. There are plenty of things in this world that can take our eyes off of Jesus. And so we have to remember, one of the characteristics of this race is that it's eternal, not temporal. We have to be careful and be disciplined not to allow ourselves to get distracted by the things of this world to where we lose 
focus of Jesus and that which he is calling us to do. And another characteristic of the race is simply this. The race is full of challenges, which really is my third point today, the challenges within the race. You see, Paul didn't want to miss out on all that God had for him, but he knew it required effort. That's why, again, in verse 25, he says, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Verse 26, so I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. He knew that living a life surrendered to the Lord was not going to be easy. Now, we're going to talk more about some of these challenges in coming weeks. Next week, we'll talk about the mindset we need to have and how we need to renew our mind and we need to you know, take thoughts captive and things like that. Then we'll talk about you know, some of the disciplines we need to develop if we're going to run and train well. And then we're going to talk about some of the distractions that can so easily keep us from that. So that's where we're going. We're going to talk about some of these challenges as we finish out this series. But I just want you to kind of have a kind of overall understanding that the race is going to have plenty of challenges as we attempt to run to win in 2023. So what are some of these challenges briefly? Well, one of the challenges is that the race is going to require endurance. We already talked about that. We have to learn to keep pressing on. We have to learn, like we said, it's not a sprint, but a marathon. So what do I have to do to be in it for the long haul, to develop disciplines and habits that are going to help me, not just for today, but help me as I continue to journey with Jesus. So it requires endurance. The race also requires consistency. You know, athletes don't just, you know, prepare for a race a couple days ahead of time and expect that training to be enough, do they? No, they have to be consistent. They have to develop a lifestyle that is constantly focusing on the competition, right? Any, any sport you look at, you know, basketball or football, there's an off season, but pretty much all those athletes, they're still disciplining themselves in terms of what they're doing in the off season so that when the season comes, they're ready. The race requires consistency. The race requires discipline. We have to be able to develop habits that will enable us to succeed because winning does not happen by accident. Winning doesn't happen by accident. If you're going to run to win in 2023 and you're going to live a year of victory where you're seeing God move in amazing ways, it's not going to happen by accident. It's going to mean that you have disciplined yourself in certain areas to really pursue and seek after God so that you can know him and see him work in amazing ways. And so the race is going to require focus. We must keep our eyes fixed on Jesus because at the end of the day, it's his approval that matters. And so we have to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And so understand, and we're going to get into this more in the weeks to come, but there are plenty of challenges that we are going to face that we're going to have to navigate through. We're going to have to learn how to discipline ourselves and how to endure and how to push through and focus if we are going to run to win in 2023. So most of us are not big track athletes, at least I, I don't think many of us are, maybe a couple of us, but not many. But that doesn't mean we get a pass when it comes to running our spiritual race, right? We might not be good at physically running, and we might like, like, like to physically run, but that doesn't give us a pass on spiritually entering the race that God is calling us to run. And if we're going to run we might as well run to win, right? If we're in this race, we might as well do our best to do it the best that we can. And so if we want 2023 to be a year of wins, then how we start is crucial. Wouldn't you agree? How we start is crucial if we're going to develop some habits and if we are going to have a year of victory and a year where we see God move in amazing ways. And so as I close out today, I want to challenge us all as a church. I want to challenge us all as individuals, and maybe this can even branch into some accountability and a partner that you can have in this, maybe your spouse, or maybe, you know, you can do this together. But something that I've, I've heard other churches have done or other people have done, I'm like, you know what, I think that would be awesome for us to try. I want to do it myself. I'm not always the best in these areas, and so I'm laying out to us because I want it to be something that can be said of my life as well, and that is 21 days of prayer and fasting. Okay, now I don't want this to be like a religious thing. And so let me explain to you a little bit about as we start. You can see January 9th, what that's when? 
tomorrow. So you have a whole day today to think through, pray through. And you might look at, you want me to not eat for 21 days? No, that's not what I'm saying, okay? We're going to build into it. We're going to grow into it. We're going to work on this together, all right? So let me explain it to you, and then we'll kind of bring it home, all right? 21 days of prayer and fasting. First of all, what is fasting? Something maybe we don't talk about a whole lot. But fasting is to voluntarily abstain from eating or drinking for an extended period of time. Eating and drinking can represent anything, really, that is holding you back. What do you consume in terms of social food, intellectual food, spiritual food, emotional food? Are these things distracting you from your relationship with God? Are you relying on things that have nothing to do with God to get you through your day? You may not even realize you have an addiction to some of these things. So let me give you an example. I'm not a coffee guy, but maybe you are. If you have to have coffee every day and you are not willing to give it up, you might be addicted to coffee. So maybe you need a fast to just be about coffee and ask God, ask God what the area is that he will show you. I'm not picking on you coffee drinkers, all right? I'm just giving you an example, all right? Maybe you're not addicted, all right? I'm not saying you are, but you understand my point here, right? It might be something else that you don't even realize is something you need, and you're relying on that to get you through your day when you should be relying on other things or not be so tied into that. All right, so that's just an example. That's kind of overall what fasting is, abstaining from eating or drinking for an extended period of time. So considerations for fasting. The goal, listen, this is important. The goal of a fast is to encounter God. Right? It's spiritual in nature. Now, you can do fasting for health reasons, right? You can lose weight by intermittent fasting, and you can, you know, do a lot. There's a lot of health benefits to fasting, but spiritually speaking, the goal of the fast is to encounter God. You're separating from certain things during these 21 days that will enable you to see God more clearly. So notice this next one. The idea is to be realistic, not legalistic, right? Please understand, the goal is to be realistic, not legalistic. So as I maybe lay out some of these suggestions, all right, don't feel like you have to follow these to a T and it's some legalistic thing. I've lived in that world before and it's not a freeing place to be. So it's not about like the, the rigid legalistic things about a fast. It's about being realistic. Focus more on the details of connecting with God than the details of the menu, and you'll discover the blessings of fasting. So in other words, focus more on the relationship with God than what it is you're abstaining from and all those details. And then here's another one. Enlist an accountability partner that is willing to go on this journey with you. Again, this is where we can hold one another up. This is where, like you guys talked about last week, this idea of you know, togetherness and having conversation and do, you know, all those kind of things. Have somebody who maybe is willing to do this with you. Their fast might look a little different than yours, but somebody who can help keep you accountable, where you can discuss and dialogue. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's somebody else in the church. But enlist somebody who can maybe go on this journey with you because it's sometimes way easier to journey with someone than to try to do it on your own. Obviously, there's an individual side of fasting because it's between you and God, but enlist an accountability partner. That might help. So those are some considerations for fasting. So here we go. Here's the suggested 21. Now notice, suggested. Suggested. Yours might look different, okay? But the goal is maybe to attempt something, right? Because the goal is that I want to encounter God. We just went through a series a while back about experiencing God. The goal of the fast is to encounter God, to get to know him more, to separate from things that are maybe keeping us from focusing on God. So week one, again, suggestion. Maybe this week, starting tomorrow, you decide I'm going to go without lunch each day of the week. Maybe it's a different meal for you. Maybe lunch is not a meal you can necessarily not, I, I don't know, but maybe suggest going without lunch for the week. Okay? Week two, go without lunch each day. Now here's going to be the hard one for some of you. This is going to be the one that's really hard for me. I'm not going to lie. And so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do my best. All right. And go without lunch for a week as well as fast from social media. Now, some of you might need that for your job. I understand that. So again, suggestions. But I know in my life, I scroll way too much on Facebook at times, and I probably should, and it kills a lot of time in my life that I could probably invest more wisely. So the confession of your preacher, right, of your pastor, that, that one's going to be hard for me. And then week three, continue the above fast, so not eating lunch, 
not having social media, and then maybe pick one or two days where you just don't eat at all. Or if you're really brave, and you're really, like, maybe try a Daniel fast. If you're not sure what a Daniel fast is, you can Google it, you can look it up, but you, you know, no meat, no sugar, no, a lot of things, mainly fruits and vegetables, nuts, those kind of things, um, and do that for the week. Now, again, it's not about what you do. It's about the goal and the mindset and why you are doing it, right? Please keep that in mind. It's about separating ourselves from things that keep us from God. And in those times when we're desiring maybe those things, we are turning our focus and our attention to the Lord and allowing this to be 21 days where we really seek his face and strive to encounter him. Does that make sense? So again, it's not about what you fast from necessarily. The, the goal is what can I eliminate or how can I, you know, deprive myself of maybe comforts that I typically used to and instead turn my attention, my gaze, and my focus to Christ during that time. Does that make sense? So again, it's something that I've heard other people doing, the 21 days of fasting. Sometimes people do it at Easter. Sometimes people do it, churches do it beginning of the year. We've never done it. I'm like, oh, that's a really good idea. But uh, honestly, it's one of those things that can be challenging. But I feel like as we come into 2023, I think it'd be awesome for us as a church to really set our focus and our attention on just seeking after the Lord and individually trying to encounter him. So again, I'm, we're not taking attendance when you walk in and say, did you fast this week? Okay, come in. But I hope that what you'll do is as part of our church family, as part of our local body, that you'll say, you know what? If my brothers and sisters are attempting to fast and really seek God's face, then I want to do my part, and I want to draw closer to God too. And so uh, as you pray for yourself, your home, our church, the world over the next 20 days, here are some things to consider. Pray that God would give us a hunger for himself and his word. Pray that we would be sensitive. Maybe you want to take a picture of this slide. I don't know. But pray that we would be sensitive, wise, and bold in sharing the gospel, our relationship with Jesus and our church with those around us. Pray that we would be committed to the unity that Jesus prayed for us to have. May we love, serve, and forgive each other. May it be clear to all that we are devoted to one another. Pray that the Lord will bless and advance our vision to be a church that this community cannot imagine being without. Wouldn't you love to be a church that our community can't even imagine being without? If living stones dropped off the face tomorrow, of the earth tomorrow, our church, there would be a big hole. Don't you want this to be a church that our community would miss if it's gone? And then you can add your own list of things and people you are praying for. Next, we're going to talk about mindset, and I've been reading or listening to audiobook. It can count as reading, right? If you listen to a whole audiobook, have you read the book? Hopefully, I, I did. I uh, read a book by Craig Rochelle talking and winning the war in your mind. And in it, there was this quote by Dr. Caroline Leaf. She's a communication pathologist and cognitive neuroscientist with a PhD in communication pathology. She's the author of Switched on Your Brain. She said this, It has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. This type of prayer increases activity in brain areas associated with social interaction, compassion, and sensitivity to others. It also increases frontal lobe activity as focus and intentionality increase. So not only does prayer change our literal brain and how it functions, but prayer connects us to the heart of God. And so as you fast, I hope that you will grow in your prayer life because that's a huge aspect of fasting. And so again, 21 days of fasting and prayer. Maybe you've never fasted before. I'm, so in your case, don't just say, don't, don't shoot too lofty, okay? If you've never fasted from like food, don't say, okay, I'm going to go three days without eating. Probably not wise. Or I'm going to go a whole week without eating. Okay, probably not wise. I'll leave that between you and the Lord. All right, but if that's you, maybe, you know, consult a physician first and make sure it's Okay. But just understand realistically. But I think there's, for all of us, it's a discipline of fasting that will be hugely powerful in our walks with Jesus. I don't do it as much as I probably should, but I know the times I have fasted, I've seen God move in just amazing ways in my life. There's been times I've been seeking just direction and wisdom, and it's been so neat to see how God just met me in those times when I was fasting. And so I want to just challenge us as a church. 21 days of fasting and prayer. 
Take that time to pray. Take that time to really just separate yourself from maybe some of those things and consider running to win in 23. And why not, if you're going to run to win, start off by kind of laying the foundation this year with 21 days of fasting and prayer. So again, I'm not going to be taking attendance when you walk in next week to say, hey, have you done it? This is kind of your own personal spiritual journey, but I hope There'll be some of you who say, you know what, I'm going to commit to doing this. I want to be, you know, commit to this with our church family. Help me not do it alone. All right, because I'm going to try. And on some of these things are going to be hard. Fasting isn't always easy, but I've seen spiritual benefits from it. And imagine, imagine what God could do in our church if we had people, uh, you know, if all of us committed to just really seeking God's face over the next three weeks in just a powerful way like this. So that's, that's it. I know it's weird. It's different. And it's something, you know, this is how we always do our services. If you're new here, like, I'm not constantly, like, laying all this stuff on you saying, you should fast and you should do all this stuff, all right? But as we start off the new year, maybe consider giving it a try. Father, thank you for this time we've had together. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for what we see in Paul's life as an example of what it means to passionately pursue you and to live your life in such a way that nothing else matters but making disciples and sharing the love of Jesus with others. God, I pray that, Father, you will help each of us. Lord, I pray that your spirit will just, Father, burn within each of us that we have a desire to get closer to you. Lord, I pray that Father, there would be many in this room who would decide that, you know what, I'm going to give fasting and prayer a try as I start off the new year. Yes, it might be challenging in some ways, but I'm going to give it a try because my desire is to encounter God. I want to know him more deeply and more intimately. I want this to be a year of victory, so I'm going to do all I can to start the year off on the right foot. So God, I pray that you'll work in each of our hearts. Father, if we do choose to fast over the next 21 days, I pray that you'll help us to see maybe some of the things we need to fast from, things we need to separate ourselves from, things that maybe are controlling us more than we realize. And I pray that this will be just a powerful time for us individually. And Lord God, that we will see just you do amazing things in our church family as we have people passionately pursuing you. So God, we love you. We thank you for loving us first. And we thank you for everything you went through so that we could be in relationship with you. So Lord, I pray that we'll be willing to do what it is you call us to do as a result of that relationship that we have. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.